شرقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصارت دمع يجري يا الهي خذ بقلبي للرشاد فاشرقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصار الدمع يجري يا الهي خذ بقلبي للرشاد يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصارت دمع يجري يا الهي خذ بقلبي للرشاد في سكون العين ادعو في سجودي والدجى حولي سواد في سوادي يا رؤوفا يا رحيما يا حليما يا كريما ما لفضلك من نفادي يا سميعا يا مجيبا يا عظيما اهدني يا خالق السبع الشيادي اشرقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصار الدمع يجري يا الهي خذ بقلبي للرشاد اشرقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصار الدمع يجري يا الهي خذ بقلبي للرشاد للهدى والحق وفقني الهي فعلى توفيقك اليوم اعتمادي يا الهي In consequence of their success in replacing the Khilafah with the modern Republican secular state, Dajjal brought into the world a new world order. How did Islamic scholarship respond? We don't have time tonight to look at the economic response. We don't have time tonight to look at the monetary response. We don't have time tonight to look at the educational response, the institutions of educational studies. We're talking about the political response in terms of political philosophy. The most significant response that came out of the world of Islamic scholarship came from India. An Indian scholar named Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, a man of eminent scholarship. I consider him to be my teacher. Although I never met him, I was born many years after his death. Dr. Iqbal is a towering scholar of Islam, worthy of profound respect. And he took on Western scholarship that 
scientific uh, method that we spoke about earlier, that if it did not come from observation and from scientific experimentation, it's not knowledge. It belongs to a place in Orlando called Disneyland. He took on this Western, I'm going to use a big word now, he challenged this Western epistemology, or the branch of knowledge which studies knowledge. He challenged it in a profound response, the best that was ever penned by any scholar of Islam. In the first two chapters of his book entitled the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, but I suggest that you go to the pharmacy and buy a bottle of Tylenol tablets <laughs> if you want to read that book. It's not easy. As a master's degree student in philosophy, I had to study that book. I read it 20 times without, without understanding it. <laughs> and only when I studied Surah al kaf of the Quran, only then was I able to understand those first two chapters of Iqbal. Hmm? So we, the world of Islam has a tremendous depth of gratitude to Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. Remember the book, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam? You don't have to go and buy the book, just go to the internet and type in Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam and you'll get the nine chapters of the book there and read the first two. But in that same book, Dr. Iqbal made a monumental <coughs> mistake. And it is no disrespect whatsoever to point out a mistake made by a scholar. It does not diminish our admiration of his scholarship. Everybody can make mistakes. And I certainly do not want students who will accept everything that I say uncritically. No, those are dangerous students. I much prefer to have students who will never accept anything that I say until you first studied it carefully and only when you are convinced that it is the truth, only then do you understand it, you accept it. And if you're not convinced, don't accept it. Iqbal declared while commenting on the events in Turkey the collapse of the Ottoman Islamic Empire and its replacement in 1924 with the secular state of Turkey. He commented on what he calls the admirable Turkish Ijtihad. That the Republican state can function as a substitute for the Khilafah. He never made a bigger mistake in his whole life. And because of that mistake that Iqbal made, so many have since then been misguided in accepting the modern secular state and accepting the system of elections of the modern secular state to form a government that will preside over the shirk. We now have even Islamic parties. I gather you have one right here in Malaysia. And you have them in Tunisia. You have them in Egypt. You have them, the most famous one of all, of course, is in Turkey. And these Islamic parties believe that you can register the Islamic movement as a political party under the constitution of the secular state and then fight in elections like everybody else fight in elections and if you win the elections and you take power then you have a gradual movement you know you allow the alcohol for some time and allow the nightclubs and so on for some time because you don't want to rock the boat do you until eventually, incrementally, you'll be able to somehow, with a philosophy called abracadabra, <laughs> bring Islam. Where is Islamic scholarship today? Is this the sunnah? 
that you walk the road of shirk to bring Islam? Mine has been a voice crying in the wilderness for a long, long time. For a long, long time I was saying the US dollar is collapse, it's going to collapse. And they laughed at me. I gather they're not laughing at me anymore now. No. For a long, long time since this book appeared, I told them Israel wants to rule the world. And Israel wants to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. And they laughed at me. Well, when Israel attacks Iran, let's see who's going to laugh. The, the Western world, with the mastermind being Dajjal, then needed an international organization that will bring all these secular states, all these republican states under one umbrella. And once you embrace them under one umbrella, you are able to now control them all. And you are on your way to world government. One world government. They started the process with something called the League of Nations, which had its headquarters in Geneva, the city where I studied international relations, Geneva. But then the, the League of Nations collapsed because the United States refused to enter the League of Nations. And then came the Second World War. And when the Second World War was concluding, they gathered the victors in San Francisco, was it San Francisco? To establish the United Nations Organization. This was 1944, I believe. Um, every state in the world now had to become a member of the United Nations Organization. And if you refuse to become a member of the United Nations organization, you're in plenty of trouble. They will take action against you and punish you and punish you and punish you. I don't know how much you know about your history, about when Malaysia was born. You're too young. And Sokarno, Ahmad Sokarno, out of anger, because he felt this was a British imperial creation, took Indonesia out of the UN. Did you know that? But <laughs> it didn't survive for long. And Indonesia had to go back into the UN. To the best of my knowledge, the only state which stayed out of the UN for a long, long time and was not punished was Switzerland. But after Switzerland had done the work that Switzerland knew, know that it has done, I no need to tell you what it was, it then became necessary for Switzerland as well to join the United Nations organization. The United Nations organization was structured with a lower house, like parliament, you know, Senate and the House of Representatives. So the United Nations organization was structured like that that all the states of the world will become members of the General Assembly. And in the General Assembly, they will all be recognized to be politically equal. So, a little Trinidad and Tobago, where I was born, next door to Venezuela, with a population of uh, about 1.3 million, uh, this little Trinidad and Tobago has a political status equal to the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Huh? Did you hear that? And there are some other states in the Caribbean which are less than that. Grenada, the island of Grenada probably has about 90,000 people. Less than PJ. <laughs> less than PJ. <laughs> And Little Grenada has a political status 
of political equality with the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. This is the nonsense that we accepted in the charter of the United Nations organization. Is this what you have done to the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam? By accepting this nonsense? But the General Assembly of the United Nations organization did not have any power to enforce any resolutions. It was a talk shop. But the Security Council of the United Nations was a different matter. The Zionists who created the United Nations organization on Dajjal's behalf made sure that they took control of the Security Council. The Security Council had authority. Let me read for you. In order, Article 24, remember Allah is al Akbar. But this charter is saying, no, Allah is not al Akbar. The Security Council is al Akbar. Whoever has supreme authority, Supreme authority means there is no other authority above it. No. That is Al-Akbar. Allah is Al-Akbar. You cannot perform Salat. You cannot move in Salat without saying Allahu Akbar. Well, listen to who is Al-Akbar. Article 24. I quote. In order to ensure prompt and effective action, by the United Nations, its members, including the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, incidentally, its members confer on the Security Council primary responsibility, meaning supreme responsibility, for the maintenance of international peace and security. In all matters pertaining to war and peace in the world, the Security Council of the United Nations has primary responsibility, meaning supreme responsibility. Meaning the authority of the Security Council is supreme. Is there any authority above the Security Council? Where is it? On the moon? Huh? Where is it? There is no authority in the world today recognized above the Security Council of the UN. And so the Security Council of the UN is Al-Akbar. If you don't believe me, wait until you get in your grave. <laughs> they wanted to put a nail in the coffin, so he had listened to Article 25. The members of the United Nations, which includes the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, agree to accept and to carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present charter. Even when the Security Council gives an order which is in conflict with what Allah and His Messenger have ordered, you have an obligation to obey the Security Council. And so they succeeded. And they succeeded splendidly in selling this institution of the United Nations Organization to the entire world and getting the entire world to submit to their authority in the Security Council. Binding resolutions of the Security Council. I wonder who are the Security Council? Who are the Security Council? The Security Council is divided into two parts. Very cunningly on their part. The Jal is a mastermind. There are the permanent members of the Security Council. Permanent means, even in Bahasa it means forever and ever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. 
And they're five in number. Five. And uh, the other um, members are called the non-permanent members and they are elected for terms of two years. Hmm? Decisions of the Security Council are taken by a majority vote. But if a permanent member of the Security Council votes against the resolution, then they use what is known as a veto. They needed to have that there to save Israel. The United States of America has used the veto so many times we've lost count in protecting Israel. Who are the members of the Security Council, permanent members? Before we answer that question, it will be interesting for you if I were to go to the Quran, to Surat al-Ma'idah of the Quran, and listen to what the Quran has to say about the world today. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have faith in Allah, la taltakhidhu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya, do not take the Jews, and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. We probably have some Christians present here tonight. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Question. Let's stop there before we go to the rest of the verse. Is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? Or is he speaking about some Jews and some Christians? problem here is methodology. If you use the defective methodology, I call it the lazy man's methodology, of studying a verse of the Quran in isolation. No scientist does that. Huh? Take a verse of the Quran in isolation, by itself, stand alone to derive its meaning. If you do that, then you have to come to the conclusion he's talking about all Jews and all Christians. But if you use the proper methodology, which every scientist does, to go to the totality of the data and organize the totality of the data into a meaningful organic whole, harmonious whole, then you look at what is a system of meaning which binds that data all together. When you do that, in this case, and we don't have the time to do it, you'll then realize, no, not at all. Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. For example, in the same Surah Al-Ma'idah, he says, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارًا and you will most certainly find in time to come that those who are closest of all to you in friendship and love, in love and friendship, would be those who say, we are Christians. So George Bush don't qualify here. <laughs> and Tony Blair don't qualify here. Because they are enemies, not friends. Those who will be closest in love and affection to you in time to come would be those who say we are Christians. This is the Quran. So how can you say to those who are closest in love and affection to you, we can't be friends with you, it doesn't make sense, does it? And so Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. Well then, if he's not speaking about all Jews and all Christians, which Jews and which Christians is he talking about? From the time you ask that question, the words which follow give you the answer. لا تتخذ اليهود والنصارى أولياء بعدهم أولياء بعض. 
That is the answer is there. Ba'aduhum awliya uba'a. Meaning, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is saying that in a time to come, the Quran is anticipating that in a time to come there's going to be a mysterious reconciliation between part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world. And there will emerge in the world a mysterious Judeo-Christian alliance, friendship and alliance. When that happens, then Allah is prohibiting you from being friends and allies of those Christians and Jews who established the Judeo-Christian alliance, not an individual Christian who has a Jewish neighbor. Don't be foolish. <laughs> has that alliance come into being? If you have not recognized it, you're eating too much roti chanai. Huh? Yes, it has. A mysterious Judeo-Christian alliance has emerged in the world thanks to the relentless efforts of the Vatican, efforts which are still continuing up to now. And it is a Zionist alliance. It is a Zionist alliance. It is that Zionist alliance which is responsible for overturning well at that time it was not known as the Zionist Alliance it was known as Jewish Christian collaboration for overturning European Christendom and bringing into being modern Western secular civilization but only in the 19th century did they actually establish the Zionist movement when the first crusades took place, for example, I was not aware until I learned that the Jews financed the crusades. <laughs> yes, so Christian-Jewish collaboration in Europe was taking place for a long, long time. When the Jewish-Christian Zionist alliance emerged in the world. Uh, these are the ones who have continuously been waging war on Islam. And Allah says in the Quran, in the words which follow, Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance. We our friends of America. <laughs> okay, go ahead and make that statement. Wait until you get in your grave and you'll see. <laughs> Whoever turns to them for friendship and alliance, you've lost your Islam. You've lost your Islam. You now belong to them. This is the Quran. Inna Allah la yahdi al-qawma thalim In surely Allah does not provide guidance for a people who, whose trademark is wickedness. Hello. Now let's go to the prominent members of the Security Council. Number one is the Zionist state. The first ruling state created by Dajjal was Britain. A day like a year. You've read this book, haven't you? A day like a year. And Britain is a permanent member of the Security Council. The second permanent member of the Security Council is another Zionist state, the United States of America, <laughs> which is the current ruling state established by Dajjal. It looks as though Dajjal is establishing the Security Council by himself all alone. The third permanent member of the Security Council is France, another Zionist state. 
So the Zionists have three out of five. And all three are Christian states which have alliance with the Jews. Hmm? But then came number four, Russia. And Russia is a European state. And Russia used to be fervently Christian. And that Christianity that Russia has is the Christianity that the Quran refers to as, as Rome. Don't tell me eh, that the Rome in the Quran is a city in Italy. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> the Christianity that Russia has is the Eastern Christianity. This one had its capital in Constantinople, which is now known as Istanbul. That one is Western Christianity, which has its capital in Rome, and then they broke up, and Protestants moved away and so on. That one celebrates something called Christmas. You've heard about Christmas? On the 25th of December. But this one celebrates Christmas on January 9th, I believe. They're different from each other. So, Eastern Christianity established itself in the foundations of Russia until the same revolution that came over Western Europe with the French Revolution transforming Christendom into the modern secular civilization. That same revolution came to Russia with the Bolshevik Revolution which destroyed the foundations of the Christian church in Russia and brought into being a new secular state in Russia. That Russia is also a member of the Security Council of the United Nations with Vedo power. I studied the subject of Gog and Magog, an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. Gog and Magog are in the Quran. Allah gave to Gog and Magog power that none could fight them and defeat them other than Allah. And I came to the conclusion that Russia and the Russian-led alliance is Magog. And the American-led alliance is God. This is my conclusion. You don't have to agree with me. No need to pick up boxing gloves if you don't agree with me. And so both God and Magog are in the Security Council. <laughs> and then they chose to, to include China as well. And that baffled me because this is Christian, this is Christian, this is Christian, this is Christian as well. All four. And then I remembered that the China that was admitted to the Security, to the security Council was a China led by Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Kai-shek, who was Christian. He was Christian. So China also at that time was led by a Christian government. Hmm? This is the Security Council of the United Nations, dominated by the Zionists. And Allah has prohibited Muslims, prohibited Muslims from maintaining friendly ties and entering into the embrace of that Judeo-Christian alliance. And guess what we did? <laughs> guess what we did? Huh? While, I was, while I was, our scholars, our ulama were eating roti chanai. <laughs> Yes, the greatest failure of all in the Ummah today is not our political leaders, not our economic leaders, not our educational leaders. The greatest failure in the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam today is the, the failure of our religious leadership. Incapacity to recognize this as shirk. 
incapacity to recognize that the Quran is prohibiting us from entering into the embrace of the United Nations organization. No fatwa, no scholarly work, none. Examining the Charter of the United Nations, none. Much less for the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> and so here we are at this very last hour when the sun is about to set with the United Nations organization have be, having been successfully used successfully used to establish Zionist political and economic dominion over the entire world of Islam they just yes just rest yesterday they used the United Nations resolution Security Council resolution to enter into Libya and bomb Libya to the Stone Age take over Libya's oil and put it to their use now. This, this just happened yesterday. Hmm? Because of a resolution of the Security Council and every single Muslim country which is a member of the United Nations is obliged to obey, submit to the authority of the Security Council. Okay. 22 years ago, I believe, 1980, 1988, 1988 will be 23 years ago. You do maths in this university? <laughs> 23 years ago, I came to Malaysia for the first time. I was based in Pakistan at that time. I was the head of the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies. And then shortly after that, I moved my base to the United States. And I remained in the United States until 9-11. When I left, I'd never been back in the United States since then. When I came to Malaysia in 1988, I came at the invitation of the Muslim Institute for Research and Planning in London, which sent me to attend a seminar, which they jointly organized with PASS, on the Hajj. And they put me in a hotel, and I saw on the hotel a sign, no durians. So I thought maybe durians were beggars. <laughs> no durians. In that seminar, I spoke as I did today to point out the folly, the folly the mistake of the Islamic movement registering itself as a political party under a secular constitution, subject to the sovereignty of the state and the sovereignty of the United Nations and the sovereignty of the Security Council of the United Nations. I thought it was an exercise of total foolishness to register yourself as a political party and to fight elections in order to win power and to rule. It was a manifest departure from the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and uh, passed didn't like it at all. But the Malay are so polite. Mashallah, they're such a polite people that after the conference was over, they sent me around the country. And there was a young man who was attached to me and to two other scholars and they sent us to Malacca and they sent us to Joho and they sent us to Kotabaru and they sent us to Kuala, Kuala Teringanu. And I had the chance to meet Ustaz Nikablazis. And I was amazed. We went into a small wooden house and we sat down on the floor and we ate with our hands. And I said to myself, MashaAllah, what a wonderful place is Malaysia. And when he spoke in the masjid, there were about 10,000 people present. And if you dropped a pin, you could hear it. Such perfect silence. And then they took me to Kolan Terengganu. And there I had to speak before 20,000 people. And there there was another scholar named Ustaz Abdul Hari 
But this one was so silent, so soft and gentle, but that one was thunderous like thunder. <laughs> and there was a young man who, our, who was our escort taking us all around. And he never smiled at all. So serious was this young man. His name was Hussam Musa. <laughs> That was 22 years ago. But I told them that you're making a mistake. The same thing with Jamaat Islami in Pakistan. The same thing with the parties in Egypt and Tunisia and some. But not because we defer on this issue. Does that mean we are enemies and there's any need for boxing gloves? No, we can defer and still be brothers in Islam. What should you do? The answer is do not depart from the Sunnah. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَ إِلَىٰ أَخِلِ الْآيَةِ This is the best model, this is the best example. And he did not enter into the system of shirk to operate within the system of shirk to bring Islam. No. He rejected the system of shirk. He opposed it. And he said, even if you give me the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, which means all the votes of KL, nope, I will not accept it. I am not going to participate in shirk. That was the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And he paid a terrible price for it. But in the end, Allah accepted his, his struggle and Allah gave him success and he is the most successful leader the world has ever seen in all of history. So if you follow the way of the Prophet والسلام, yes then times are going to be very bad now, terrible now, but tomorrow you will succeed.